Well, Merry Christmas to everyone this morning. How are you feeling today? It is a joy to be here with you at all of our campuses, at our Franklin campus, our Banda campus. For you watching online today, wherever you are on our online campus, in this country, out of this country, in our state, out of our state, we welcome. Can we give it up for everyone watching online right now? Thanks for tuning in. And of course, for everyone here at the Greenwood campus, welcome, welcome, welcome. How many of you are excited about uh, Santa coming to town in just a few days? Anybody excited about that? I am. I've asked Santa Claus for a brand new pair of basketball shoes this year, and uh, so I'm very excited about that. There's a new KD's 11 that are out. If you don't know what those are, those are Kevin Durant sneakers. Uh, they help you move faster, jump higher, and they help your jump shot to fall a little bit better. And so if you believe that, I'll tell you another one. Uh, but at least you feel that way when you put a new pair of KDs on. So very excited about that. And hashtag ball is life. Um, if you don't believe that, you know, this may not be the church for you. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, hopefully you're excited about something that Santa is bringing. Or maybe you're excited about something that someone else is receiving from Santa, if you know what I'm talking about. So uh, that's a good, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive, right? We went through all that, that whole series there. So anyway, welcome to Emmanuel. We're in a series right now called God With Us. This is the, actually the fourth installment of this series, the fourth uh, week of this series. And we've been talking about how Christmas is really the story of, of how God has come to be with us. That's the good news of the gospel. And uh, we've been looking at a passage from Matthew, the Christmas story as told through Matthew's eyes. And, and at one point, Matthew records uh, something that Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Matthew says this in Matthew 1.23. He says, look, the virgin will conceive a child and she'll give birth to a son. And we will call him or we will, you will call him Emmanuel, which means, say it with me, God is with us, right? That's what the name means. And that's where we got the name for this church, that the Christmas story is really about this baby being born of a virgin coming into the world to make it possible for human beings to live with God. Not just after we die. That's true because the baby would grow up and die on a cross and pay for our sins. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit so that we can have our sins forgiven and go to heaven when we die. But also to be with us right now in our real lives, in the valleys that we go through, in the times of wilderness. That's what we talked about two weeks ago, the times of wilderness wanderings that we go through. And last week we talked about how God is with us even in the struggles and the fights that we face all the time because we have an enemy who's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. You can watch any of those talks on our website, eclife.org. If you miss them, I promise they'll be a blessing to you. So today all I want to do is kind of continue the conversation and talk about how God is with us in a different area of our life, and that is in the area of sin. God is with us in our sin. And some of you are like, see, that's why I don't like coming to church because the pastor is going to call me a sinner. Hold on, hold on. Let me go first. I'm a sinner. <laughs> I'm a really good sinner, actually. Try not to be, don't want to be, but it happens. I'll give you an example. Two weeks ago, we were, I was having a sort of one of those weeks. I don't know if you've ever had one of those weeks where you're just kind of overwhelmed and stressed out and there's a lot of things going on. And I was kind of having one of those weeks and just trying to keep my head above water and just do the right thing and be nice and be kind, and I blew it. Um, one particular morning I woke up and I asked my wife to do something for me and went to work and came to the church, la da da, a lot of things going on, we've got three children, life is busy, come home that night, we're sitting around the dinner table and I asked my wife if she did what I asked her to do, and she said no. And in that moment, <laughs> with my three kids there, my wife there, I had just kinda tripped out a little bit and I got angry and I got upset and I didn't say anything I just shot her one of those husband looks anybody know what I'm talking about just like that look of utter disgust like are you serious I think I even shook my head like and she saw the look and I've given the look before and it never goes well which begs the question why do you keep doing it? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I need to see a marriage counselor probably or something like that. But I shot her the look. She saw it. And immediately, you know, she sensed the disappointment, the disapproval, the, you know, the anger or whatever was wrapped up in that. I didn't, again, I didn't say anything. It was just a look. And so she started to kind of shut down and she didn't say much for the rest of dinner. And then I was upset. So I didn't say much. And, you know, that's how the rest of the evening went. And we have this rule uh, sort of that we don't go to bed angry at each other, 
you know, but <laughs> that rule went out the window, <laughs> you know, we didn't talk to each other that night. Next day, we only said what we absolutely had to say because we have these three kids that we have to keep alive, you know what I'm talking about, feed them, get them places, and that's all that we said. And about the second day or third day, I can't remember, you know, I felt, you know, this conviction that I was being a complete jerk, which I was, I was. I was being impatient, I was being unkind, I was rude, and I was angry, and God told me so. And those are sins that I struggle with. There are others, <laughs> but those are some that, that hit me regularly and I'm tempted to give in, especially when I'm tired and overwhelmed. I have my sins and you have your sins. Maybe it's overindulgence. Maybe you struggle with that, overindulgence with food or a substance or alcohol or Netflix. That's an acceptable sin these days. <laughs> Binge watching Netflix till five in the morning. <laughs> I don't know what your sin is. Maybe it's greed. Maybe it's materialism. It's all about the next thing you're going to buy and making more money and accumulating stuff and idolizing money. I don't know. Maybe your sin is worry. That's an acceptable sin in our world today. You know what we're going to do one time? We're going to do a, a series called Acceptable Sins. That will be fun. Anyway, not my point today. But worry is one of those sins like, oh, everybody worries. It's, worry is actually a sin. It's not trusting God. I don't know what yours is. I know what mine are. Maybe, maybe yours is lust. Maybe you have a private sexual sin that's just kind of dominating your life and hope, you hope nobody finds out. You certainly hope your spouse doesn't find out or your girlfriend or your boyfriend. I don't know, but we all have it. One of the smartest people to ever live, his name was Solomon, he said this in Ecclesiastes, not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. Not a Mother Teresa, not a Billy Graham, it doesn't matter who it is, every single one of us struggles with sin. The question I want to ask today, and it's really the question we've been asking in this whole series, is sort of this question, like, where is God when we sin? Like, where does he go? You ever think about that? I'm sure you have. Where does God go when we blow it, when we're impatient or unkind or we give in to lust or anger dominates us or fear com completely or anxiety completely controls us. Where does God go when we sin? I think a tendency today for many, especially people of faith, people who have trusted Christ as their savior, a tendency is for them to think that God distances himself from us when we blow it. And here's the thought process. Well, I'm a Christian now, or I've been a Christian for a year, or two years, or 10 years, or 20 years, or maybe even 30 years, and, and I'm still tripping up with anger. I'm still tripping up with, with, with you know, coveting or, 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 or gossip, you know, or whatever the sin is. And I can't believe in God. God must be so disgusted with me. He must be, you know, angry, upset. He must think I'm a failure. He must, he must wanna, wanna just completely distance himself or disconnect from me. And that makes sense because isn't that how human relationships work, unfortunately? I mean, I would, if I polled the audience today, both online and at our physical campuses, and I asked you, is there someone right now that you've distanced yourself from because of some sin, some infraction, some wrongdoing? You would, most of us would say, yeah, because that's how human relationships work. That's how it works in my marriage, unfortunately. Somebody does something, says something, doesn't do something, doesn't follow through, is rude or obnoxious or impatient or whatever, and now there's this thing, and, and two people, you just start to drift apart because there's been, a, there's been a hurt, there's been an infraction, there's been a wrongdoing, and if, and if two people don't come to their senses and say, hey, I'm sorry, would you forgive me? I was wrong, I was a jerk, I, I sinned again. If that doesn't happen, two people continue to drift apart because that's the way it goes, and then someone eventually files for divorce. And so we naturally think, well, if that's the way it works in human relationships, and that's the, I'm, it's like that with my dad right now, I don't talk to him, I don't talk to my brother, because this thing happened, and, and so we don't speak to each other anymore. If that's the way it works in human relationships, it must be, that must be the way it works with God. I've done this or this or this, so God's probably just, I'm done with you. And I'm here to tell you today that that may be the way it works in human relationships, unfortunately, but that is not the way it works with God. The answer to the question of where's God when you sin is God is with you in your sin. Where does he go? He goes nowhere. He stays right there with you if you're a believer. Now, if you're not a believer today and you, don't, you haven't trusted Christ, guess what? Same is true for you. God may not be dwelling inside of you as he does for a believer, but he's omnipresent and he's right there when you sin. See, 
it's, it, we don't often think about it this way, but let me, let me kind of challenge your theology here a little bit. Maybe not all of, all of you, but sin is the primary reason that the baby was born. Like, <laughs> if you go back to the story in the book of Matthew, like, Matthew, uh, Joseph was engaged to Mary, and they were going to get married, and all of a sudden, Joseph discovers that Mary's pregnant. And he's like, well, it ain't from me. So you must have been out with some other guy. And so I'm going to, here's what I'm going to do, because I'm a nice man. This is Joseph. I'm not going to publicly disgrace you. I'm just going to break the engagement off privately, right? Because I know the baby's not from me. And so all of a sudden, an angel shows up. I'm translating here. An angel shows up and says, hey, Joe, hey, Joe. It's not the case. She's not like that. Mary didn't go out on you. She hasn't been with another man. This baby that's inside of her is actually from the Holy Spirit. And then the angel says this in verse 21. And she'll have a son, and you're to name him Jesus. Why Jesus? What's with that name? Why not Mark or Bart? Wouldn't that have been fun? Bartholomew was a popular name back then. Or Zach, why not Zacchaeus? That was a popular name. Why not Luke? Why Jesus? Here's why. Because the name Jesus means God saves. Yahweh saves. See, the reason that his name was Jesus because is that, that describes the mission that he has. The angel continues and says, for he will do what his name says. He will save his people from their, say with me, their their sins. Like that's the, like the Christmas morning and the manger and the, the animals and the dung. And there was lots of dung, folks. And the mess there, right? It was so messy. Their whole purpose of the whole deal was was for Jesus to save his people from their sins. Far from running from us when we sin. He comes to us to solve the problem of sin. In two ways. In the first way, he comes to solve the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin. See, the penalty of sin right from the Garden of Eden was separation from God. See, sin and God are like oil and water. They don't mix. They can't be together. Sinful man and a holy God, they don't, they don't go together. And so God created us to go together. So we had to solve the problem of the penalty of sin, which is separation from God, both in this life and in the next. And so what does he do? He sends the baby. Listen to what John said, one of the closest disciples of Jesus, John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2. He himself is the sacrifice. Jesus himself, the baby himself is the sacrifice that does what? That atones for our sins. And not just for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. What does it mean to atone? It means to make it right or to erase or to remove a wrongdoing and bring two parties back together. The sacrifice of Jesus atones for our sin. He removes the penalty, which is death. He dies in our place. Is anybody else excited about that but me? I mean, come on. Can we give him praise for that? Some of you are not excited because you don't understand how big of a sacrifice that was. We would be in big trouble without Jesus atoning for our sins. We'd have to atone for our own sins, and we could not do that. So he comes, the baby comes, and he dies on a cross And he rises again to atone for our sins. But it doesn't stop there. He doesn't just remove the penalty of sin for us. He also deals with the power of sin. See, Just because you trust Christ as your Savior and the penalty of sin, which is death, is removed from you. And you no longer have to pay. That does not mean that the hooks of lust... And the hooks of anger and greed. And I can continue. Gossip and the hooks of envy have been rendered ineffective. See, a person can trust Christ in their life and the penalty of sin is removed, but the power of sin remains. If a person spends a decade or two or three in patterns of anger and impatience and unkindness and rudeness, just because someone says, Jesus, come into my life and forgive me of my sins, does not mean 
that those patterns and behaviors just simply disappear. And, and, and many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Here you are a decade, two, three decades into your faith and, and, and you're still getting tripped up by certain sins. That's what I want to talk to you, take the rest of our time and talk to you about today. How does the presence of God in our life deliver us from the power of sin today in two ways? First, first of all, God's presence helps us not to give up. See, the first thing we need to learn when we're dealing with the power of sin is to never, ever give up. The tendency is to think that, that again, that God, if he sees what I'm doing, then he's disappointed and, and he's upset and he's disgusted and he probably wants nothing to do with me. And he probably thinks I'm a gigantic failure. I certainly feel like a failure. So let me just throw the cards in and I won't take my faith that seriously. Maybe I'll show up at church at Christmas time. Did I just say that? I think I did. <laughs> it's just all not that serious. I can't be a good Christian like so-and-so and so-and-so. I'll never be like the pastor. I'm just a terrible, terrible Christian. At least I'll go to heaven when I die. That's the tendency. If God is sees all and he's with me in my sin. And we give up on trying to become like Christ or trying to become a strong Christian. It's interesting how, why that, how that happens because God's presence is actually designed to do the exact opposite. See, Jesus was a grace embodied. Jesus was total mercy. And so when he sees us in our sin and when he's present in our sin, he, he remembers our frame. He, he knows that we're like dust and we've, we've been made from the dirt of the ground. And, and, he, and he, instead of bringing harsh judgment, he brings grace to us. Instead of running from us when we blow it or sin, he leans in to us. See, what you and I have to understand is he wants us to become holy more than we want to become holy. Let me say that again because it'll change your life. He, he wants you and I to become holy more than we want to become holy. He's not going anywhere. He's 100% committed to seeing you become like himself. I remember when I was, uh, my kids were small and they were on training wheels and it was time for, to take the training wheels off. Anybody else have this experience as a parent? Or maybe you were the kid and, and your parents were doing it for you. And it was an exciting thing because I, I, I you know, I, I wanted my kids to ride a two-wheeler. It was very important to me. I don't know why. I don't know why. It's like a thing. And so we would get out there on the street and, and it was like, okay, today's the day. We're taking the training wheels off. You know, we're going to go. And dad was with them up and down the street. <laughs> you know, it's summertime. You do this stuff in the summertime. You know, sweats pouring. You know, it's <laughs> down the street. And then I'd let go for a little bit. And oh, over they go. <laughs> okay, get back up, get back up. Wipe yourself off. All right, let's try it again. Oh, I don't want to. Come on, let's try it again. I don't want to. Let's try it again. You know, and down the street, down the street, down the street, sweats pouring. I let go and they fall over. A couple of scrapes, go inside, get a band-aid. Let's try it again. Let's try it again. A couple things that, that happened there in that story, and I remember it for all three of my kids. It was a little bit different for all three of them. But I remember thinking, I want this more for you than you want this. That wasn't true for all three kids. There was one kid that wanted it more, but that's okay. <laughs> Stick to the point. <laughs> and the second, the second thing I remember was that there was no way I was giving up. If they wanted to try again, there was no, I was there. I was physically there. I was holding the back of that seat. And I, if, can you imagine if I'd have said, like, after the third time they felt, man, you're terrible. I'm going in the house. <laughs> like, when you figure it out, call me. You know what I'm saying? Can, can you imagine a father saying that to a kid who wants to learn to ride a bike without training wheels? I mean, no. Like, I'm like all in on this deal. Like, let's go. Let's go. Get back up. Put a Band-Aid on that thing. Brush yourself off. And, th and God allowed me to see through that whole scenario of helping our kids learn to ride bikes. That's what he's like. Far from running from us when we fall over and scrape ourselves and blow it. He's there. He's like, come on, get back up. Get back up. Band-Aid. Brush off. Let's go. First John chapter 1, verse 9 says it like this. If we confess our sins, which 
That's what mercy does. We just got done singing about it. When, 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 when we realize the grace of God is there and Jesus is a person of grace, we don't run. We come to him. We said, you're right. I blew it. That's what confession is. I was prideful. I was angry. I was impatient. I was rude. I fell into lust or whatever it is. I confess it to you. Guess what? He is faithful and just to forgive us, but not just to forgive us, but to also cleanse us. As detergent cleanses a cloth or a stain out of a shirt, he cleanses us from what? All unrighteousness, all sin. This is what the presence of God does. It helps us to keep getting back up. This is perhaps the most important lesson I've learned in my spiritual life about how to continue to grow spiritually. Because every time I blow it, instead of running from God or allowing my sin to, to cause me to drift away from God, as happens so, to so often to so many Christians, I go, wait a second. The reason he came into the world is to help me with this. Why am I going to run from him? Why, gonna, why am I going to feel down about this? Why am I going to get discouraged about this? I'm going to go back to the one who came to help me solve this. Jesus, you're right. Wash me, cleanse me, forgive me, get me back on that bike, and help me to keep going again. Is anybody understanding this? Is this powerful? It's called grace. It's called mercy. It's called unconditional love. This is what the present, this is how he helps us overcome the power of sin in our lives. And this is what he did for the Israelites in the, in the wilderness. The psalmist records in Psalm 78 verse 40, oh, how often repeatedly they rebelled against me in the wilderness and they grieved my heart, yet he still brought them into the promised land. He didn't throw them away. Their story is our story. We have a God of grace and love. And then secondly, eventually, the presence of God eventually helps us to do the right thing or leads us to do the right thing. So how does the presence of God help us to overcome the power of sin? We know the penalty of sin is taken away because of the cross, but how does the presence of God now deliver us from the power of sin? Well, eventually it helps us to do the right thing. I was a mischievous kid in middle school and high school. Anybody else? And so my brothers were very, very good boys in middle school and high school, and they were older than me, and they were right ahead of me. And I've always thought, man, you guys live a boring life. <laughs> and so I, I wanted to see what was out there, and so, you know, with the opposite sex, and I did different things, and, and I was pretty mischievous, and a lot of times I was up to no good, unless my mother was in the room. And that's when things got Real serious. So I didn't mess around when mom was around because mom had um, a bit of a temper. She's 100% Puerto Rican and she wasn't afraid to use her force to inflict pain. If she had to, the shoe would come flying at me. One time she smacked me with a ruler. Another time she broke a paddle on my backside. A wooden paddle, broken in two, right on my backside. I deserved it. She brought the wrath. She also brought amazing amounts of love and tenderness, hugs and kisses every single day. In fact, I get my tenderness and hugs and kisses and I kiss my kids and love on them probably more than they want. I get that from my mom. When she would step into the room, I would straighten up because her presence caused two things to happen. I didn't want to incur the wrath. Okay, you with me? Yes. And I also didn't want to hurt her heart. Because she had taught me right from wrong and she had brought me to church and she, you know, we don't do this and we treat people like this. And, and so if I blatantly did that stuff, I knew it was like, it wasn't, you know, in, in line with what she had taught us. So I had that, that tension there. Of, oh, mom's here. But as soon as mom was gone... What can we get into? I think it works that way with God. There's a father and a son having a conversation. Actually, it was just a, a, a letter sort of written in Proverbs chapter 5. And this father was telling his son how to avoid sexual sin, which is so relevant for today because our whole culture is entirely sexualized. And this father saying, hey, son, here's how you're going to avoid sexual sin and adultery and all this other stuff. 
you're going to realize that God is with you. Listen to Proverbs chapter 5, verse 21. Dads, use this with your sons. Son, listen up. For a man's ways are before the what? The eyes of the Lord. Another translation, he sees everything that you do, everyone you're with, everybody you touch, everybody you have a conversation with. He sees all of your behavior. Now remember the context of Proverbs 5. It's how to avoid falling into the trap of sexual sin. Son, God sees all. But he doesn't just see it. He does something else, son. He also ponders all of a man's paths. In other words, he thinks about why you're doing it and when you're doing it and how you're doing it and this angle and that angle and this angle. And he's thinking about your entire life. He's not just observing it. He's pondering the motivations of your heart and the intents of your heart. Why is Solomon telling his son this? Because he's trying to help his son realize that when God is with you, when you realize that the presence of God is with you all the time, it destroys the power of sin in your life. How? Because, number one, you don't want to be cross with him, okay? God disciplines those he loves, his children. But again, you also don't want to hurt or grieve his heart. Psalm 78, verse 40, how often they grieved my heart with their rebellion. It hurts God when we sin. It hurts his heart. He has feelings. He has emotions. He, he wants us to do right. And when we do wrong, it grieves him inside. I know that you don't want to do that intentionally. I certainly don't. But we do when we, re- when we think he's not watching or he's not there. It's like, oh, I'll get away with it. This is what saved Joseph from falling into sexual sin. Genesis chapter 39. Remember the situation? Joseph is in charge of Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife comes to Joseph. Joseph was about 30 years old. He's in his prime. The Bible says he was handsome and good-looking. Potiphar's wife says, look at that guy. And so she didn't have a job, so every day she's coming at Joseph saying, sleep with me, sleep with me, sleep with me. Finally, it gets gets to the point where Joseph has to say something, and he says, hey, listen up. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master, your husband, Potiphar, has withheld nothing from me except for you up, because you're his wife. (laughs) How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Did you get it? We would all be very, very wise people if we would memorize this statement. How then can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? I don't know the exact context of what was going on in this moment, but you can only imagine Joseph is there and it's a big mansion and they could certainly find a room and do what they needed to do and not get caught. They could certainly have, quote, gotten away with it and no one would have found out. But see, Joseph had this this awareness of the presence of God. He knew that God was pondering all of his paths and watching everything he did. And and so he might have gotten away with it from a human perspective, but he wouldn't have gotten away with it from God's perspective. How then can I do this wicked thing and sin against my God who sees everything? The answer, you can't. See, Joseph and Solomon had this in common. They both believed this statement. There is no such thing as a private moment. When you're alone in your room or wherever and you're doing your thing on your phone and nobody else is around and the door is closed, not a private moment. Don't kid yourself. Looking at inappropriate things on your phone or your tablet or whatever. Not a private moment. A man's ways, a woman's ways are before the eyes of the Lord. And when you realize that in the same way that when my mother walked into the room, you go, no more shenanigans, mom's here. That is the effect that the presence of God has in your life if you could cultivate an awareness of it. It eventually helps us to do the right thing. When you're alone at the office with that coworker and you think, well, nobody's here. It's just us. Nobody knows. Not a private moment. God is watching. When you're tempted to steal and no one else is around and you know there's no cameras in the room or whatever, not a private moment. There's no such thing. 
And when we realize that, we begin over time, again, not immediately, but over time, we begin to do the right thing. So what have I said today? It's very simple. The, the, the message of Christmas is, is the good news that God has come to be with us. The baby came to deal with sin, both the penalty and the power. How does the presence of God help us deal with the power? It helps us to keep getting back up when we blow it, and eventually it helps us to do the right thing. Two questions for you as we wrap up. You know I like to ask questions. Number one, where do you need to do the right thing? What do you need to confess to God? It's the grace of God, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance and leads us to confession. He's right there. He saw you do it anyway. What do you, is it anger? Is it lust? Is it greed? Is it theft? Is it deceit? Is it gossip? Is it envy? Is it jealousy? I don't know. You know. You know what it is. Where do you need to do the right thing? What do you need to confess to God? Second question. Will you allow the presence of God in the future to lead you to do the right thing in that area? Will you invite the presence of God into your everyday living because when you realize that he's there eventually you start to honor him and do the right thing because you don't want to be cross with him and you don't want to grieve his heart this is the message of christmas this is why the baby came in it's not about the presence and the trees and the lights and all that the songs i love all that stuff too santa's coming that's fine but what's the real purpose behind it all the savior came into the world in the form of a baby so that he can be with us by removing the penalty of sin and defeating the power of sin. For some of you here today, you're not a believer and you need to take a different step. You need to trust in Christ for the first time. You've never put your faith in him. Today you heard that the sacrifice of Jesus atones for your sin. What does that mean? It means to wipe it out, to take it away. Why would he wanna do that? Because he wants to be with you. He doesn't want you to join a religion. He doesn't even want you to join a church. I think those two things are fine. I think you should, I like our church. You should join our church. But that's not what he came for. He came so that he could be Emmanuel, God with you by removing your sins. And why would he do that? You always got to ask why. Why would God do all of this and create humanity and a human race and where there's problems and there's sin and there's destruction and there's pain along with all the joys and the highs and the beauty? What is going on? Why would he do that? Why just, why create the human race at all? One reason, love, love. God is love and love unknown is love unfulfilled. So he made you and he created me to know love. Listen to what John said in 1 John chapter four, verse 10. This is real love. Not that we love God, no, 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 but that he loved us. He created us to know his love. And that's why he sent Jesus to be a sacrifice, to take away our sins. Why? So that we could be with him. Will you trust Christ today? Will you put your faith in him today? Will you step into a relationship with God today? If that's where you're at right now and God's tugging on your heart and you feel that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a simple prayer. Take these words, they're actually your words. They're your words to say to him right now in this moment. Place your faith in Christ and become his child. Will you pray with me? In this holy moment, just between you and God, say this to him. Dear Jesus, I receive your love today. I believe you died on the cross to atone, to take away, to wash away all my sin, to remove the penalty and the power of sin in my life. I trust you today. Be my savior. And from this day forward, help me to live with an awareness of your very presence in my life. I pray this in Christ's name. And everybody said, amen. Can we give God glory, guys? Amen. Amen.
If you just trusted Christ, our church, Emmanuel, whatever campus you're at, online, there's a little place there you can check that says, I trusted Christ. I would love to invite you to go back to, the, to whatever auditorium that you're at, whatever campus you're at, and receive a new believer's Bible. We want to get a Bible in your hands. We believe that as you read God's Word, you become transformed. You begin to think like God and feel like God and act like Christ. So please pick one of these up on your way out if you trusted Christ. Can we give God glory one more time, guys? Here's what I'd like to do.